job, Lonnie. How are you? Good, how are you? Hey, how are you? Good evening. Good evening, everybody. We got we got quite a few announcements to do. Uh, Cliff Richter is still in the hospital, downtown Baptist, receiving treatment. Continue to pray on his behalf. Uh, Lola Pate spent several days in the hospital due to an infection and low potassium uh, Shay told us um, told us she's being released today uh, please continue your prayers on her behalf please remember Liam Calvert in your prayers he's the son of Laura friend of Wendy Saunders he has multiple health issues and has been in the hospital for months uh, often in very critical condition conditioned so we want to pray for all of our our sick we're unaware of and our shut-ins and our missionaries and the military in this great land and country we live in and our leaders um, the blessed meal is this saturday from 11 to 1 right here in the fellowship hall it's going to be the menu consists of variety of spaghetti dishes garlic bread salad and desserts the sign-up sheet is in the fellowship hall tonight if you'd like to help back on that table over there i think in connection with this on that same morning there's going to be a swap party beginning at 9 a.m for church members and a little later on for the others everyone is asked to bring things like clothing and decor and jewelry whatever you want like garage still stuff i guess to swap with the others Please see more info in the uh, most recent bulletin. Um, there will be people here at 8 a.m. <clears throat> setting up. If you can come that early or even bring a table, that would be great. So somebody want to explain about this swap party, how that's going to work? I thought you were in charge. I'm just reading announcements. <laughs> okay. I think there's no money exchanged is what I understand. And if you see something, you want it, and then you can get it and, or you, and bring. I don't, I don't know how they're going to do it. What if two people want the same uh, Exactly. Thing? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Bring a bag. Huh? Bring a bag. Oh, bring a bag and just put it in your bag, just like you're shopping at, at Betty's place. Just like you're shopping at Betty's place. Just take... take Stama said, bring a bag, and if you want something, put it in a bag, just like when we shop at your place. 
Yeah, well, it's going to be a, a swap store. But, but I thought it was more just, just bring, it's not my place, John. Uh, you don't have to take stuff, right? You, you can, can just drop stuff off. Yeah, but my wife said, we're, my wife said, we're bringing stuff and don't you bring nothing home. <laughs> So, it could be very interesting. Okay. Okay, where are we here? Um, September 24th is our fourth Sunday night fellowship. We'll be having breakfast for supper. That sounds good. And our youth will be preparing and serving waffles, pancakes, scrambled eggs, and bacon will be provided. Uh, you're asked to bring fruit and desserts on the 24th. We are honoring newlyweds Kelsey and Andrew Johnson with a, a gift card basket, best wishes card for the shower. The basket and the cards are in the fellowship hall this evening and in the foyer on Sunday. We are creating a basket of goodies for Laura Calvert's family. This is a friend of Wendy's whose son Liam is, has been in the hospital for so long. He's a special needs adult child and his health has been critical for months. The basket is in the ladies' classroom, room 20, this evening, and will be in the hallway on Sunday. Please read your bulletin for suggestions uh, what to bring. Also, in our prayers, remember uh, Ruby, William and Ruby's grandmother. She's very sick this week. I think she's got what everybody else, what's been going around. And I, I hope I don't get it. I don't want it. Joy Hendrick, friend of the neighborhood that lives right across the street from Ray and Nell, the lady that makes the fudge, um, she's been put on hospice care and, and just given a short time to live. So we need to pray for her. Um, I got announcements all over the place. October 7th, uh, 2 to 4 p.m. is Ladies' Day. Sign up is, is on the back table if you want to go to that. The Aggies of Christ. Aggies for Christ will be here the weekend, October 13th through 15th. We need host families to provide housing. How many do you want, Mark? <laughs> I bet if they were Longhorns, you'd bring them in the house. <laughs> so that's uh, October 13th through 15th. Housing. Uh, we need host families to provide housing for Friday night and Saturday night, 13th and the 14th. You'll be responsible for providing breakfast each morning, Saturday, Sunday. The other meals will be provided in the fellowship hall. The October birthday potluck will be uh, on the third Sunday this month, only the 15th, in order to provide the Aggies with a good meal before they head back to A&M. A uh, sign-up sheet is in the fellowship hall tonight, and thereafter will be in the youth bulletin board in the hallway. This is this is not a youth event, though it is a, a ch all church event. So please consider signing up to host some Aggies. Uh, please contact Christy Joe Brown if you uh, for more information. You can get a hold of Christy Mark if you want to. Okay, let's uh, have a prayer for all of our sick. Thank you, Father, for this day. Father, we come tonight to praise your holy name and give thanks for, for this another day of life and all the blessings you give us each and every day. Father, please be with our sick. We especially pray, pray for Cliff Richter and as he's still in the hospital and undergoing treatment and Please spare his life, if it be your will, Father, and be with the doctors that, that they can do the right things to his heart and, and get it going again and, and uh, so he can live a few more years and in comfort, and we miss him very much. And uh, please heal him, if it be your will. Be with Lola Pate, be with uh, Liam Calvert, and be with all of our sick, Father, our, we're unaware of and our shut-ins in our missionaries and uh, it's great land and country and be with uh, Ruby and, and William's grandmother they're asking for prayers that that you you heal her and uh, this be with us tonight fathers we study your word as we 
as we are learning to love, uh, no matter what age we are, we, we need to learn how to love and, and be with us as we talk about unconditional love tonight and um, so we can treat each other the way we want to be treated. And uh, just thank you and continue to bless us. Send rain. Father, if it be your will, forgive us in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody, I'm, I'm trying, I forgot to find the song, It Is Well With My Soul. I need to, I don't remember what number that is. It's one of my favorite songs, It Is Well With My Soul. If somebody beats me to find it, let me know. Thank you. Three twenty-five. Three twenty-five. I didn't bring my hearing aids tonight. Three forty-five. Yes, that's it. Okay. Um, let's see if we can do this song. It's a great song. One of my favorites. Three hundred and forty-five. We'll do all four verses. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buff Fit though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. 
What a song. What a song. Does anybody remember what we talked about last week? The first lesson? Yeah. Learning to love. I got an extra book if anybody needs one, wants one. Uh, Just review real quick last week about we need to change if we're not loving the way we should be. Um, a need for change. We talked about if it's so hard and we get in such comfort zones. Remember, it talked. He said, "Sit on the other side of the church next week," and I forgot to do that. He said, you think, you think it's going to be easy? It's not. We're all getting our comfort zones. We want to sit right where we want to sit. That's what we talked about last week. And I told my wife, and, and she went in the regular spot because she forgot too. So we didn't change. But that's part of the deal. Uh, he said, remember, if you want a better wife, be a better husband. If you want a better husband, be a better wife. If you want a better boss, be a better employee, and vice versa, and on and on. If you want a better friend, be a better friend. Willard Tate, really smart guy. So tonight, we're going to talk about experiencing God's love, God's love, the way he loves unconditionally no matter what. And one of Lonnie's favorite stories is the prodigal son. This is really, and it talks about that too. But let's go ahead and, and listen to the, the DVD. And uh, then we'll have, we got questions at the end to talk about unconditional love and the whole story of the prodigal son. And both sons, both sons learned a lesson in that. So, Mike, we just pushed the button here. Good thing you stayed in here, brother. Our creator. In this series, he teaches us one of the great principles of our entire life, that the almighty creator of the universe cares for each one of us. What a concept. Learning to love, part two, relationships. Chapter 10 and verse 27. 
gives an insight to three relationships that we need to establish. That's what we talked about last week. In the last session, we said that was the, the key to life. First of all, is a relationship with Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's not easy established. And God understands that we as flesh having difficulty relating with him, so he gives us pictures. And the first picture he gives is our Savior, our God, as a husband and a wife relationship. And so throughout the Old Testament, God is pictured as the father, I mean the husband, and Israel as his bride. And so in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5, the Bible says, your maker is your husband. And then in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, he says, Return, faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, the Bible says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. And then when you come to Ephesians chapter 5, and we think it's that love chapter on husband and wife relations. And down in verse 32, at the end of the chapter, he says, hey, it's a secret. You know what a secret is? It's something most people don't know. And he says, the secret is that I've been talking about Christ and his church. I haven't been talking about really, I've been illustrating my husband and wife. That's the way I want Christ and his church to be. You get the point of the relationship? That means it's a warm, loving relationship with our Creator, with Jesus. It's not like some king and his servants, and, but just a relationship like husbands and wives have. And he gives another picture in case we didn't understand that. He says, I want you to have a picture of uh, a parent and their children. And so the Bible, the entire Bible, pictures our God for us as Father and His people as children. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, the Bible said, Yet to all who receive Him, to those who believe in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Becoming His children. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, God sent His Son that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His own into our hearts, the Spirit that calls out Father, Father. That's a beautiful, loving relationship. Like a parent and a child has. And so the first thing, real relationship in life, is that relationship with Jesus, our Savior. And the second relationship is with others, our neighbor. And you know, statistics tell us that that's the key to joy and happiness. Even non-Christians, 85% who responded were asked said, my most, our greatest happiness had to do with happy experiences involving other people. What I'm saying is the greatest joy in life comes through beautiful, harmonious relationships. And the greatest sorrow and sadness in life come through broken, distorted, and unharmonious relationships. You see, the Bible commands us, Jesus commands us not only to love our neighbors, but to love our enemies. And I don't even do well with my wife sometimes. And my children. Do you see how far we off them? <laughs> It's kind of like Will Rogers said, just, you know, crowd on your neighbor for practice. You can work your way up. <laughs> well, I was in the National Speaker Association, and I was visiting with Jim Newman. Jim's probably done as much work on self-esteem, I suppose, as anybody in America has a film out. And I'm saying, Jim, what do you do? Someone comes to your office, and they feel badly about themselves, and relationships are poor, and you only have a few minutes. What do you say to them? You feel so helpless. He said, we just ask our people to help other people feel better. Now, as far as I know, that didn't come out of a 
religious background, but out of observable reality. That's the way we made us. God has somehow so made us that when we reach out to help others, we find healing for ourselves. Concentrate and think about ourselves and we get sicker and think about others and we get well. Somehow we're made that way. Another reason we need to love others is because they're so valuable. And incidentally, that's really going to be the heart of the rest of this entire seminar. Are these others that's so big that I hope we finally see? Why are they valuable? Because they're so beautiful or intelligent or have such super personalities? Hardly. Because Jesus died for them. I tell you, if I could ever learn that, can you, can you understand how differently I would relate to people if I could keep at the forefront that Jesus died for them and they're valuable in every contract and every relationship that came through? You see, that's what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. This is how we know what love is. It's kind of a test and measure and balance. It's the scale that everything's measured by that Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And God's saying that people are so valuable and they're so important that I'm going to hold you responsible to how you treat them. And these neighbors become so big, they just loom in our lives. And who's our neighbor? It's probably the one you're sitting by tonight. I want to read a passage. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Husbands, in the same way be considered as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing may hinder your prayers. Do you hear what that's saying? That says to me, if I don't treat my wife properly and right before God, that God may not even hear my prayers. See, how do you deal with those times in your life when they've left the clothes on the floor? Or they left the toilet seat lit up? <laughs> the socks are in the right place or whatever. And you see, God doesn't cut you off in traffic. He doesn't do those kind of things. And he doesn't give you a hard time when you're trying to write a check. Do you see how it's people? And the prodigal son. You know, there were two prodigals. One was at home. Down at church. <laughs> I believe in singing it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Teaching a Bible class, maybe. Doing all the right things socially, right? I think everybody would have said, hey, you got one son you can be proud of. Which one was worse? Sins of the flesh or sins of the attitude? So you know what that means? You can be lost here at church. So unless you have a relationship, and it starts... I'm saying that people, relationships, and when you close that story of the prodigal son, you know what happens? Hey, he's standing outside. His dad's begging him to come in. You know why he won't go in? He says, my brother's in there. Hey, his father was too. You see who's between him? Those others that get bigger and bigger. Hey, hey let me, can we just take a curb corner stop? And we'll just keep the car idling so we can come back. But can I tell it the way it didn't happen? Jesus didn't tell the story this way. You know why he couldn't tell it this way? Here's the way I can imagine it happening. Wouldn't this have been beautiful? One morning that elder brother gets up and he looks at his dad across the dining table and he says, Dad, I watched how you hurt. I watched how you aged and how your heart is crushed and you're grieving over your son and my brother and I'm leaving and I'm going to go find him and I'm going to bring him back. I tell you, 
That had been a great day, you know. And that day that Dad was shading those eyes from that low sun to see if he can find a sun coming down the road, he wouldn't have found just one. That had been two suns coming arm in arm that day. So it had been a great day. But Jesus didn't tell it that way. You know why? Because of us. And our pride, and our jealousy, and our selfishness. It didn't happen like that. Well, a third relationship that this verse says we need is a relationship, a healthy relationship with ourselves. Back in the 60s, Books started being pumped out by the thousands on the shelves on self-esteem. It had enough truth to hook us, but it had some falsehoods. And we kind of bought it all hook, line, and sinker. And we got the idea that if I just kind of picked myself up my own bootstraps and I liked myself better, everything would come up roses. And we bought them and we read them, even got them in our pulpits. It had a lot of humanism in it. Because, see, ultimately it leaves out God. If you buy it wholeheartedly, the idea is I just get better and better until I really, I don't really need Jesus anyway. And that good news of the gospel just kind of becomes mass news, right? Because we're never lost anyway. Hey, I have got good news tonight, though. And the good news is you can go to heaven without liking yourself. Isn't that great? And the fact that you like yourself has nothing to do with you going to heaven either. See, we've got to say it's on a relationship with Jesus. That relationship has to be rich and strong and alive. And it's not how I feel about myself, but it's how I feel about Jesus. Now, see, I think the biggest problem in our life is not self-esteem but the disease of sin. And the only answer to sin is a Savior. And see, one of the things that man fights so desperately is to confess his neediness. And man is needy. And he needs a Savior and he can't save himself. And man has always tried to save himself by earning it. And he can never do that. See, again, the prodigal son story. And it's so great because it's it has the Bible in miniature. Man's rebellion, God's amazing grace. And when did that son in the far country turn it around? When he saw his neediness. Now, if you have a sin problem solved through a relationship with Jesus as Savior, now that if you'll choose to like yourself a little better, you'll be a better gift to others and to God. And I think that's it. Liking yourself a little better. And how do you do that? How do you get up every morning and say, I like myself better today because of my relationship with Jesus and have it real, have meaning? How do you do that? Well, it's all your mind talk. It's what you're saying to yourself about yourself. And see, you're talking to yourself all the time. You're talking to yourself while I'm talking to you right now. You say, I wonder what games we'll be on television this afternoon. Or, I wonder where she got those clothes. <laughs> I'm talking to myself while I'm talking to you. And see, I can tell you that I think you're beautiful and you're lovable, but unless you're telling yourself that, it really doesn't. So you know what that means? The mind has to manage the mind. You have to think about what you're thinking about. And you have to manage your mind talk. Because you're talking to yourself constantly almost. And what you're saying about that relationship to Jesus makes all the difference about how you feel about yourself. And so much of our self-talk and that mind talk is self-defeating. In fact, if I were to say to your face what some of you say about yourself, you'd probably punch me in the nose. <laughs> little exercise. Hey, I believe it'll change your life. Take a little three by five card. And right on the front, in big, bold letters, I am loved. And then turn it over in the same size letters, write the word, I'm a child of the king. 
and then put it right here next to your heart, 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 <laughs> and read it over and over. A thousand times a day if you have to. So that it not only gets to the intellect and the cognitive, but I mean it's the heart and emotions. And you know what that means? That means when you get through bawling me out, you get through being rude to me, guess what? I'm still up. <laughs> God loves me. The most profound thought that a person can ever have, that I'm loved. Hey, you can't think about that without having worth and value. Sons, child of the king. Now then, I think it may start like this, liking yourself a little better, breathing in the fact that God loves you. That's on that little card. You breathe that in over and over, and then you breathe out love on other people. And all of a sudden, love is flowing through you, and it kind of cleanses, and you start an epidemic. And that's how you become alive in Jesus. When love flows through you. I had a unique experience. I was getting a privilege of working with the football team at the university. And after two days, I was going to have the privilege of working with the coaches. Jerry Wilson came in first. I could see fatigue all over him. I said, how you doing, Jerry? Oh, he said, pretty good. He knew he had planned to have a late session. I listened. He said, uh, you know, night before last, our Lockers came in about two weeks late. We stayed about three or four o'clock at night trying to get them in before all the football players get here for the two days. And then last night he said the copier broke down. We're trying to get the playbook ready to, to give them so we'll have them when they arrive. And, and he said, I guess we're tonight, if nothing goes wrong, we might get through by two or three o'clock. I looked at him and I said, Jerry, why do you do that? Why do you do that? Hey, I knew about his salary. I knew it wasn't for money. I noticed on his hand he had a national championship ring. I said, Jerry, is that worth it? He shook his head and said, no. Nah. No, man, that's not worth it. I said, what's well, worth it? He said, that guy sitting right there. That guy sitting over there. Those guys out there, they're worth it. That's what God is saying. I willingly, willingly gave my son. They're worth it. And somehow we can get in touch with that. Loving God and relationship with others and ourselves is the way it helps us be God-like. If you haven't read this book, that you can find it on Amazon. It it uh, it's really good. It, it'll change your life. It uh, it's just amazing. Anybody have any thoughts? Anything grab you? What he said.
That's right. And that's um, that's what uh, he wants us to read. First John. If you'll turn in your Bibles, let's look to First John chapter uh, three and four. He mentioned he mentioned some of those verses. First John chapter three. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. and uh, And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for every for we shall see him as he is everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure everyone who sins breaks the law in fact sin is lawlessness but you know that he appeared so that uh, he might take away your sins and in him is no sin Uh, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Uh, No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does uh, not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is the measure you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and was murdered, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees uh, his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with, with words or tongue but with action and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us the for god is greater than our hearts and he knows everything dear friends if our hearts do not condemn us uh, we have confidence before god and and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him and this is his command to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ, and to love one another as uh, he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. All right, Lonnie, that's your, Lonnie's always talking about the spirit. Um, Chapter 4 is not too long. 
uh, test the spirit. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which uh, you have heard is coming, and even now is ready, already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that, that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him, and he in God and so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives uh, out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made is not made perfect in love. We love because he loved us. If anyone says, "I love God," yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who uh, does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And uh, he has given us this command whoever loves god must also love his brother wow okay now it's y'all's turn to talk a couple of questions here John? yeah uh, i think it's interesting that the story of the prodigal son that you brought about that brought into the message was a good one that, you know i have a feeling that the younger son Yep. And the, the dad knew it. And when he demanded his inheritance early, which is unheard of, uh, his father gave it to him. We do not know what the father told him, but evidently the father told him, son, when you get tired of being out, you come back. Because the father was looking for him. He knew that his son was going to come back. The father loved his son. He wanted him to come back. Bless you.
I can have with no love for your fellow man. You're like that prodigal son's older brother that stayed there and now and what was his attitude toward his father? You never gave me anything. You know, I slaved out in the field and you never gave me anything. But then he lived at home and had all the business of being at home and being one of one of the heirs, one of the children. Yep. So um, he doesn't discuss everything in the third chapter. In the book, he says, we're brought up, we were raised to conditional love. When we were little kids, if you didn't do what you're supposed to do, we got in trouble. We, we, we're just raised like, if you do this, then you're, you're uh, you know, I'll love you, mom and dad. But if you don't do, your mom and dad, you're going to get punished. So everything we brought up, we lived in is conditional. It's, it's really, I encourage everybody to read this book. Please, I'll let you borrow one. He gets to more of it. So this unconditional love is, is, is different than that. He loves us no matter what. Just like the father knew the son was going to go get rid of everything. But he loved him anyway. We love our kids anyway, don't we? So... What sort of love did, does John want us to have when we teach, uh, when he teaches us to love our brother? And the following qu uh, quote appropriate for is the following quote appropriate for Christian? I love my brother in Christ, but I don't like him. Why? Why do we say that? And then one more thing, real quick. Willard Tate says you cannot reach out and help another soul without stretching your own soul. So anyway, was that the bell? Okay. Thank you all.